Arizona's superstition mountains have been a magnet for generations of adventurers and treasure hunters. Many who come to the mountains seeking riches never return. In 1860, a miner called the Dutchman staggered out of the mountains more dead than alive. Something had kept him going when others would have given up. He had been tortured by Indians and seen his partner murdered. For days, he had traveled alone under the blazing sun. What was the secret that gave him the strength to survive? It was treasure, great nuggets of gold. The Dutchman said he'd found a mine full of it. He would never be strong enough to go back for more, however, and the secret of the mine's location went with him to the grave. The rugged and barren superstition mountains are sacred to Apache Indians. They say the thunder god lives here in a gold-filled cave. To trespass in the hallowed cave is to activate a terrible curse. The Apache believe that only they can travel safely through the superstitions. Search for treasure in the Superstition Mountains begins at Weaver's Needle. The remnant of an ancient volcano, it has become a beacon for adventurers. Some treasure hunters believe the megalith marks the center of a magic circle that contains the untold wealth of a lost civilization. Long before magic powers were attributed to the area, Spain's conquistadors penetrated the mountains searching for the legendary kingdom of Cibola. They believed Cibola was composed of seven cities made from pure gold. The Spaniards even resorted to torture to pry information from the natives. The Apache has always related differently to the superstitions. They only say the mountains hide a sacred cave protected by a curse, guarded by rattlesnakes, charged with lightning bolts. Some say the Dutchman tore his treasure from the walls of the secret Apache cave. The Dutchman did claim that his partner was murdered. Perhaps it was an act of Apache vengeance. Gold has always inspired some men to acts of violence and great sacrifice. Ancients thought the metal had magic powers, that gold harnessed the energy of the sun. For centuries, alchemists tried to create gold in their crucibles. The secret always eluded them. Today we know that gold is one of nature's basic elements. It can't be broken down into any simpler substance, nor will it readily combine with another element. Thus, gold endures for all time to be sought after and measured out as the universal symbol of wealth. Since the Dutchman staggered out of the mountains with his sack of gold nuggets, no significant strike has been made in the superstitions. Yet the seekers keep coming, in spite of the lack of evidence, the harshness of the country, and the history of tragedy for those who've come before. It's an obsession, seemingly shared by most gold hunters. Some look for lost mines, like the Dutchman's. Others are after the legendary vein of pure gold, flowing like a river of yellow metal from the planet's molten core. This they call the mother load. Once, prospectors had only intuition and simple tools to pursue their quest. Now they have metal detectors and Geiger counters. Intuition still plays a big part. Pat Bowl is a retired science professor, recently turned prospector. His intuition paid off with an offer of $15,000 for an unusual sample of gold-bearing rock. I got 13.9 this spring when I, when I sold it, gave some to the government, and ended up with $9,000 $9, for 20 minutes' work with a pick. This will make a prospector out of anybody. Pat Bull may never find the vein of pure gold, but he has that fever now called the gold bug. It has driven other men to chip, blast, and burrow in the earth 
searching for the ultimate source. The stampede that follows a strike is called a gold rush. In 1878, a rush hit Bodie, California like a flash flood. Known only as a place where miners could occasionally scrape out enough ore to live on, Bodie suddenly became a boom town, producing $200,000 a month in gold bullion. The town grew from a three-family prospector camp to a thriving community of 800 buildings and 10,000 people almost instantly. Two years after it began, the boom was over. A year later, the town was nearly empty. How often this phenomenon occurred across the gold fields isn't known for sure. No one remembers what happened to camps like Sucker Town, Gage Eye, Red Dog, and Hardtack. The gold didn't last long enough for them to have a past, much less a future. Today, many treasure hunters hear echoes of the gold rush and believe any one of a thousand tunnels that perforate the western mountains could tap the mother lode, or the lost Dutchman's mine. While preparing his book on the Dutchman legend, Robert Blair studied gold miners and dreamers. He concludes that without mineral evidence, miners wouldn't search the superstitions for gold. Dreamers, however, might. I suppose people go looking for the lost Dutchman for their own reasons. I can only speculate what those reasons are, but I think that a great many of these people who search in such a, an unpromising location for gold as the superstitions are going more for the adventure uh, than they are for any serious expectation of finding a rich gold mine. I think they're going for, for their own reasons as far as their own psychology is concerned, but perhaps it's an acting out of fantasy. It's one of the few places in the United States today which is unchanged. It's a wilderness area. There are no motor vehicles in there. It's almost like the old Wild West, when men went in with guns, fought it out among themselves, looking for a lost mine. Maybe the threat of Apaches is in the minds of some of these men. Maybe the man finds that when he's in the mountains that he becomes another person. He becomes more manly. The machismo effect may be working in the minds of those men who dig so endlessly in the superstitions and so fruitlessly.